Hello everyone, I'm Tanya, and today I'm going to talk to you about an introduction to open source GIS for forest monitoring. This video is the first in a three-part series, and in each part there is a lecture video and an exercise video. And so in this lecture we're going to discuss introduction to open source GIS and the accompanying exercise, which will be narrated by my colleague Kevin, will be exploring the QGIS interface and adding data to QGIS. So as an overview, today we're going to talk about what is GIS, the fundamentals of GIS, and then you will have an exercise exploring the QGIS interface and adding data. Our learning goals for today are to gain an understanding of fundamental GIS concepts and terminology, to learn about different types of raster and vector data for Liberia, including those relevant to repelled, and then to explore the QGIS interface and add Liberia data. So the first thing that I want to answer is what is GIS? Many people hear the term GIS and have absolutely no idea what it stands for. Well, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems or Geographic Information Science. And this is a computer system that can capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage, and display geographic data. So geographic data is any information that can be mapped, anything that has spatial coordinates. For instance, your location right now can be mapped and therefore can be made into spatial data. In GIS, spatial information is represented as layers. So these layers here, so each different layer would represent a different type of spatial data. So be it street data, which is represented as lines, which we'll talk about in a moment, housing, or parcels, which would be represented as polygons. You can do elevation data, or perhaps land use data. And so all of these layers act as a proxy to mapping the real world. Why is this important for community forest monitoring? Well, one thing that we can do with GIS is quantify rates of forest loss over time. This example of the map below. So you see deforestation, from 2000 to 2014, which is shown in red, and then you have forested areas that are greater than 80% forested are in the dark green, and so on and so forth. And so within GIS, we can create maps that are informative, such as this one. Uh, we can also compare forest loss among different community forests within the area. We can also compare rates of forest loss and fragmentation inside and outside of community forests. So GIS can also be used to stratify repelled monitoring areas. So we can stratify these monitoring areas within locations of high versus low forest rates um, and then high versus low forest edge habitats as well. So GIS is really the convergence of three different technological fields and traditional disciplines. So on one hand, we're dealing with computer science. Um, on the other hand, we're dealing with geography. And lastly, we're also looking at our application area. And so we're trying to combine these three technological fields and traditional disciplines using GIS. So all three of these things we need to consider when we're working with GIS. So a few things before we move forward that I want to discuss. One is just some basic terminology that we'll use throughout this talk. I might mention GPS, which stands for Global Positioning System. And this is a system of Earth orbiting satellites that can provide precise location on the Earth's surface. So you might be familiar with the GPS in your phone or perhaps the GPS in your car. These all use satellites that are orbiting the Earth right now to provide us with location information. The other term that I might use is remote sensing. And remote sensing is the use of satellites or aircraft to capture information from the Earth's surface. Digital ortho images 
are a key product of this. These are map accurate digital photos and this all makes up the science of remote sensing. We use these sorts of images and satellite imagery to do remote sensing. And then lastly, GIS, what we discussed earlier, geographic information systems. Now this is a software system, again, with the capability for inputting information, storing information, manipulating and analyzing this information that we put into it, and then displaying it in the form of a map. So GPS and remote sensing are sources of input data for GIS. So GIS data, it represents real world objects. For example, we might have a layer that is a roads layer, or one that's land use, or trees, or elevation. And so these are all proxies for the real world. This is our best display of real world information. We put all of this data into what is known as a GIS data model. So all of this information goes into our GIS, and then we can manipulate it and create outputs in the forms of maps, or just do spatial analysis on this data and then output it in the form of a map that we can then use to help us better manage and monitor our forests. The GIS data model, data are organized by layers. Again, I'm really stressing that in this talk because that's a very key message in GIS is that everything comes in a different layer. And whenever Kevin show, walks you through the exercise in the next video, you'll see that you can um, move things up and down um, and move layers on top of one another. But we'll get to that momentarily. Each layer represents a common feature. Again, I mentioned it could be, say, rivers or roads or streets or administrative boundaries, or in our case, perhaps it represents a park boundary or a community forest boundary. And these layers are integrated using explicit location on the Earth's surface. So all of these have an X and Y coordinate. Each of these has spatial information associated with it. This geographic location is the organizing principle behind GIS. So this is an example of a GIS data model. We have three layers here. We have our roads layer right here, which you can see we have a latitude and longitude for this road. And then we have water or hydrology, or in our case, a river or a stream. And then we have topography, which would be the elevation data of the landscape. And so the layers, each of these layers is comprised of two data types, the spatial data, which describes the location, so where is this road located? And then it also has an accompanying attribute data, which specifies the characteristics at this specific location. So perhaps this, this road right here has a name, and so whenever we click on this road in our GIS, not only do we know the spatial location, but it'll also give us the name of the road, or perhaps how long is this road, or what is the speed limit on this road, for instance. And so all of this information, what's called an attribute data, is stored in a table. And so all geographic data has four properties. It has a projection, which we'll talk about in a minute, a scale, accuracy, and resolution. Trying to dive into each of these a little bit more. A projection, again, like I said, we'll talk about this in more depth momentarily. This is a really important concept. But this is really just how we project this information, taking a 3D surface and putting it onto a 2D surface um, in our GIS. The scale is the ratio of distance on a map to the equivalent distance on the ground. So for instance, if our road is 500 meters long, what will this be represented in in our map? Our road might be five centimeters long, and this five centimeters might represent 500 meter road. The accuracy, this is how well the database information matches the real world. So you have accuracy on the position, how close, our features to their real-world location, consistency, so do these features in the database match those in the real world? And for instance, this might be like, is this road a road? Is that tree actually a tree? Things that we can, can go out and, and double check in real life. And then completeness, are all real-world instances of features present in the data set? So are all roads accounted for? Are all trees accounted for? If not, what's the completeness of our data set? Did we map 60% of the trees on the landscape that we're looking at, or did we map 100%? This all feeds into how accurate our data are. And then finally, we have resolution, which is the size of the smallest feature able to be recognized. And so if you have, if say that your resolution is actually 50 meters, but perhaps you're trying to map something that's you know, 10 meters by 10 meters, 
then we may not actually pick up that object if our resolution is too coarse. So there are different types of GIS data that we'll talk a bit more about as you explore the QGIS interface. So there's vector data, which this consists of points, lines, and polygons. And these are stored as what's something called a shape file. And they have this SHP extension on the file name. And then, oops, here we go. Back to the slide. The second type of data is raster data. And this is a gridded data, and this is what's shown down here. So these gridded data, these are attributes are recorded by assigning each cell a single value based on the majority feature in that cell. So for instance, this right here, say this blue right here, this blue is all within this one square. So this blue would then be represented as water. But say for instance, we had a blue and then just a little bit of green in one square. Well then that particular cell might be majority blue, or in our case, majority water, and that bit of what would be land might be represented as water within the raster imagery. It all depends on the size of our cell, and so this feeds back into the resolution of our data. So just to, to kind of drive home this point, say that this is our real world. We have a house and a stream and some trees here, and so in vector representations, trees right here are represented as polygons, and then we have represented houses as points. So this point right here represents a house. This point right here represents another house. This stream would be represented as a line. So we have our line data right here. And then these trees here represented again as polygons. So we have forests, houses as points, the stream as a line. And this is a vector representation. So these would all be shape files. But if we were to represent this as, as raster data, then this would be gridded. And we would say, OK, this cell right here is H for house. This cell down here, H for house. These four cells, because it overlays these trees here, we're going to call these trees. These four cells will be trees. This, These R's right here would all be the river. Because if we just overlay our grid right on top of our real world situation, then that's how we would be able to map it out. So rasters are grids, vectors are lines, points, and polygons. So. For our monitoring, these are examples of points, lines, and polygons within this repelled method. Our plots would be represented as points. Our transects that our plots go along would be represented as lines. And this entire area where we're sampling our module would be represented as a polygon. So this would all be vector data, points, lines, and polygons. For gridded data, but if this is our real world example right here, and then this would be how it would look in raster format. So the attributes are recorded by assigning each cell a single value based on the majority feature in that cell. So in this case, we're looking at different forest types. So we have pine, fir, aspen, and then riparian zones, and then not forested. And so these 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we've corresponded to represent 4 as pine, 0 is non forested, 2 is aspen. And so in our attribute table, you would just see fours, threes, twos, ones, and zeros. But these would all represent pine forest or fir forest or riparian zones. Satellite imagery, as we mentioned earlier, is one source of raster data. Image data is a special case of raster data in which the attribute is a reflectance value from the geomagnetic spectrum. And cells in image data are called pixels or picture elements. With our human eyes, our two eyes, we are able to see within the visible spectrum of the geomagnetic spectrum. However, satellites give us the opportunity to see beyond the visible spectrum. And so we can have sensors that, for instance, pick up infrared light. And so therefore, we can then collect that imagery and analyze things beyond the visible spectrum. There's a ton of satellites that are orbiting the Earth at this moment, and they have varying orbital patterns, and so this varies their temporal resolution. So some of them are orbiting the Earth at faster speeds than others are, and they go in different patterns around the Earth. And so, for instance, there could be some satellites that we receive an image from them of a certain location every day, 
whereas other ones it might take 14 days to receive that same location. And so there's high and low pixel resolution. So some of them have resolution where you can look down by the centimeter, really, really high resolution imagery. And then others might be 30 meters by 30 meters or the highest resolution, such as Landsat. Or we could have 250 meter resolution, such as the satellite MODIS. And these can be classified because every object emits a unique spectral signature. And so this helps us to then take this information collected from the satellites and to then classify this information to where we can make sense of what we're actually seeing in this image. So one example that we've used in Liberia is, this, is Hansen's Global Forest Change Data. So this is a global data set. So again, a satellite that just is constantly orbiting the Earth. It's 30 meter resolution I and mean, it measures forest gain and loss since 2000. So this satellite has been going since 2000 and so we have it's 2018 now, so 18 years of, of forest data globally at 30 meter resolution. There's a few factors that determine how and why and what data we collect for GIS. So typically that has to do with, with accuracy. How accurate do we need the data to be? Time, how much time do we have for data collection? And how much money do we have to spend? Other types of GIS data include historical aerial images, GPS data, which I mentioned earlier, satellite imagery, which we mentioned, and then LIDAR, which is really high resolution imagery. GPS, this is a global navigation satellite system. It provides the geolocation and time information to a GPS receiver anywhere on the Earth where there's an unobstructed line of sight to four or more GPS satellites. You might have a GPS on your phone right now, or you could have one in your car, or you could have a handheld receiver GPS. This was launched by the U.S. Department of Defense in 1973. And GPS can be exceptionally useful because we can take different points at different locations and then we can either on our device or jot down in our notes what this specific location represents. And then we can upload this information on into our GIS software and then continue to do analysis based on that field data that we collected. There's many, many free online portals for downloading data. And I, this is something that we'll talk about either at the end of this lecture or in your first exercise associated with this lecture because it's just kind of endless amounts of, of data that are out there. Fortunately, there's lots of free information readily available online. GIS data is stored in two different ways. One, you can store them as individual files. So say that we have all of these GPS points that we collected. We could keep that as just one individual file. Or you can upload it into something called a file geodatabase, which then helps us to organize all of our GIS data. Lastly, we're gonna talk about projections today because map projections are something that can be quite challenging for some individuals and understandably so. It's a bit of a hard concept to grasp, but hopefully as we walk you through this, you'll have a better understanding by the time we're finished. Map projections, it all starts with latitude and longitude. So latitude runs east to west and helps us to measure north and south on the globe. Whereas longitude, running from north to south, and help us measure west to east on the globe. Projection is just the method by which the curved 3D surface of the Earth is represented by x and y coordinates on a 2D flat map. So we're trying to take something that's 3D and make it 2D. Therefore, distortion, it's inevitable. And with that, every different type of projection that we use has some sort of trade-off. These are a bunch of different types of projections. And as you can see, there are slight differences in all of them. We're going to discuss three of my favorites and kind of dive into how these are different. Say that you took a piece of paper and you placed it over the top of a globe. And then you tried to match these different points on the map onto your sheet of paper. This might be what your map looks like. Whereas say that you did it where you had more of a triangular shape and then did the same thing, trying to trace the globe onto your triangle, this might be what your map looks like. Again, if we did it with just a full cylinder of paper, say around our entire globe, then our map might look something more like this. So now we're gonna dive into this just a little bit more. On the left, we have what's known as the Mercator projection. And on the right, the Gauls Peter projection. So if you'll notice the map on the left, the Mercator projection, the continents are distorted at the poles, kind of squished together here at the equator. So though these are squished together at the equator and elongated at the poles, we're keeping the true shape of each country, but at the expense 
of distortion on the map. Now if we go over to the Gauls Peter projection, you'll see that that the countries are much more representative of their size. So just for example, if we look on the left map, we see Greenland here. And Greenland looks just about as big as Africa does. Well, what if I told you that in reality, Greenland is 14 times smaller than the continent of Africa? So on the Gauls Peter projection, this actually is much more clear. The issue with this map, however, is that the continent's actual shape gets a little distorted. However, the size stays more true than, say, the Mercator projection. There's another type of projection which is sort of a trade-off between Mercator and Gauls Peter, and this is known as the Winkle triple projection. And this is actually the official projection of National Geographic. I think they made their official projection a few years ago. And this does the best to maintain the shape and the size of countries. It's a really good trade-off between Mercator and the Gauls Peter that we saw previously. So just to kind of illustrate this more, if we put the same size circles across the globe, gridded, and we were to reproject them, this is what it would look like in Mercator projection. You see bigger at the poles, more squished together at the equator. The Gauls Peter projection, they're just a little bit more distorted than they are within the Mercator. So true, true shape at the Mercator, but not true size. True size at the Gauls Peter, but not the shape. Gets a little bit distorted. Whereas the Winkle triple, this kind of is the the best solution between the two of those types of projections. So projecting layers in QGIS, this allows users to define a global and project-wide CRS, or coordinate reference system, for layers without a predefined coordinate reference system. So say that you create a layer and you don't have a reference system or a, um, a projection system, QGIS allows you to set the projection system for this layer. QGIS also allows users to define custom coordinate reference systems and supports on-the-fly projection of vector and raster layers. So even if you have two different layers that are of different projections, then it'll still align those two layers in QGIS because you can project on the fly. And this allows the users to display layers with different coordinate reference systems and have them overlay properly. And I've a link to a QGIS projection tutorial here, which you can follow after the lecture. This concludes today's lecture, and now I'm going to pass it over to Kevin, who is going to walk you through adding layers and QGIS and exploring the QGIS interface.